Hello, girls, guys, or otherwise. This is Rich with your Witchy Book Club series. This week, we are going through Lesson 5 of Modern Magic, uh, 12 Lessons of the High Magical Arts by Donald Michael Craig. There is going to be a link down in the description box down below, so you can get your own copy if you have not gotten your own copy yet. I do urge you to get... Uh, your copy from a local bookstore or uh, witchy shop if that is something that is accessible and safe for you to do so uh, rather than going to the Amazon link but an Amazon link is being provided down below uh, as per our grandest tradition we're going to start with the first sentence of the chapter to see how it really opens up the chapter but before we get into that, let me just go through our little spiel here. Of if you are not yet subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell notification if you've already done all that. Leave a comment down below to tell me if you agree, disagree, or if you think I left something out that I should not have left out. Um, maybe I overlooked something or something of that nature. If you've done all of that... Um, consider sharing this with those out there uh, if that is safe for you to do so. If you are not yet a patron and you would like to be a patron to help uh, give towards our goal of having a church here on YouTube, a Christo Pagan church, then uh, the link is down below. Thank you to our patrons on Patreon. Uh, we have Sophia, Linda, and Tyler. Thank you very much for being patrons. Um, and if you would like to get something back for your money and you can give money, um, consider uh, going to the link down below for my eBay store that helps me and my partner, you know, survive. And um, yeah, if you have done all that, thank you very much. You are an awesome human being. Anyway, um, let's go ahead and start out on... We're on page 163. We're starting with the first sentence of the chapter, which reads, Stress affects us all. Stress can, ca can be caused by hearing or reading about po politics or economics, job worries and situations, relationships ups and downs, health issues and major concerns. Absolutely. Um, I don't feel that this is... Uh, is setting us up for the entirety of the chapter. The way that he tends to set up the chapters in this um, in this entire course seems to be a little not. I don't want to say hickledy pickledy because some has to do with the other, um, but the parts to each lesson um, they have their own individuality. So if I were going back and redoing this entire series. I would probably say, okay, let's start with the first sentence of part one, the first sentence of part two, and see how those uh, reflect the rest of that part. Uh, however, that's not our grandest tradition here, so we're not going to go back and just reinvent the wheel. Um, I think that it does say a lot, though, about how stress affects us all. You have good stress and you have bad stress, and we are living in very stressful times at the time of this recording which is the 11th of march 2022 um we are seeing russia invade ukraine and we have um a florida you know is passing the don't gay say don't say gay bill which is completely horrific uh we have pastor greg Locke out there saying that there's there are witches in his congregation and he's basically saying he's gonna dox people um you know to give out addresses and and whatnot he's threatening his own congregation uh six members in in particular saying that these individuals are witches which effectively puts their lives at danger given the extremism of uh his church his um his uh, circus tent that they actually use for church um because they don't actually have like a building of a church is why i put that in air quotes um yeah i mean we have horrific things that are happening in the world today and these are just the ones that are coming off the top of my brain that um are concerns of mine we have q and honors we have people that are not even facing true facts you know the facts you know 
as they are, they are completely oblivious to them. They are blaming individuals that have absolutely nothing to do with the rising gas prices and crap like that. You know, we are living in very stressful times, um, as far as I see it. Uh, certainly, there have been more stressful times in the world, and I'm not going to negate that, but we have stresses in the world. Uh, which is one reason I pretty much try not to uh, get on the topic of these major things that ha that cause us the negative stress. Um, and this is one of the few instances that I actually do that other than our Table Talk Thursdays. Table Talk Thursdays, we have a uh, full riff of, you know, here's a question, let's talk on this topic. And if we have sidebars or updates, you know, we'll, we'll get into those. But... Uh, you know, whenever it comes to the Witchy Wednesdays, the Tarot Talks, the uh, Witchy Book Club series uh, videos, I try to keep them more what, what they call green because they are something that lasts outside of a particular political environment or economic environment, whatnot. So, yeah, I, I just relate to this opening uh, two sentences that he has here. Because we can relate to that. Just remember, there are good types of stress as well. Things such as, you know, hey, I have a deadline for getting this video out. It, it helps me. It gives me an outlet for making videos and whatnot. So this is good stress. Um, you know, I, I, I do love doing these videos. I do like, you know, interacting with you all as individuals. And I think this is the a fun outlet and uh yeah that i would consider a good stress the the stress of hey i need to ship things out for ebay is good stress because ultimately it is uh being productive and it is uh, uh mm, how can i say this the the best way um it, it's being productive and uh progressing me towards my ultimate goals of having my ebay store go full-time those types of stresses are good stresses so yeah I, I i am i am really there for these opening two sentences but let's go ahead and move on i want to move on to page 164 at the very top he says luckily she was strong and determined she combined yoga acupuncture hypnotherapy to wean herself off the drugs she stopped seeing her psychologist she still gets stressed from time to time, but she has strategies for dealing with it. In fact, she now teaches classes on stress reduction at her place of work. Okay. A couple things with this. One, psychiatrists give out meds. Um, psychologists uh, just evaluate. Um, that is the major difference. One is a... Uh, is a doctor of medicine, one is a doctor of uh, of the mind, basically. I mean, they both deal with mind stuff, but yeah, psychiatrists give out meds, psychologists do not. So I, I want to make that distinction there. That's something that kind of bothers me. Um, and there was a point in time whenever I was looking into being a psychologist, because I don't want to be a person that writes meds for people. I want to yeah, be able to... Uh, you know, help with the mental processing and, and stuff like that. I never wanted to be one that dealt with medical uh, stuff as far as writing medications and whatnot. So, yeah, that that uh, is something that kind of bothers me. Turns out that's not my uh, my my path in life. Uh, you know, maybe in a in a different alternate string universe, uh, I am a psychologist. You know, wearing a tweed jacket and whatnot but not in this lifetime thank you uh, uh another thing that i have on this is i don't agree with self-diagnosis uh but i also don't think that someone should be given pills to deal with everything i don't want to negate that there are certain things um uh, certain um types of conditions where a a pill to help maintain a chemical balance um that for somebody who is imbalanced chemically is sometimes needed absolutely without a doubt i don't want to negate that however um 
I am against in, in if this situation that he says is completely accurate as to the events that have unfolded. Um, I don't agree with the fact that a doctor should just be shilling out pills because it might make the person feel better. They they should be evaluating and trying their best to pinpoint what is going on, what is wrong um, with one situation or another in order to help best uh, help better the client in the best way possible and i have a a big problem with just throwing pills at something and you know seeing what works um so i i kind of bumped on that one a little bit i have a lot more uh um uh, in terms of complaints in this uh in this lesson than i do the than than i do agreements i i would say um but let's go ahead and move on to page 167. And uh, let's see. I want to make a point on part three. Because he talks about the Rose Cross ritual. In this one, I actually have a compliment. Thank you for saying what this is actually going to do or what this is there for before actually uh, telling us to do a ritual. That is a pet peeve of mine whenever... Uh, you know, in witchy books, you should know what you're, why you're doing what you're doing before they're saying, go do this. No. Um, last thing I want is to be sitting, uh, in ritual, you know, going through all the motions, saying all the things that are supposed to be said in, you know, in a language that I don't necessarily understand, um, and end up bringing forth something or trying to cause something and then being like, hey, by the way, you just, you know, brought forth a demon or some, you know, some stuff like that. I, I don't want to say crap like that because, you know, totally possible. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I have a thing against doing the motions and then finding out why you're doing it. It, it should be the other way around. Um, this is why I want you to do this, uh, this ritual, these, uh, these ritualistic aspects and you know then here's the instructions on how to actually do them i think it is important to to be upfront and honest with the individuals that you are teaching so i i do want to give kudos for that one the next one that i have is on page 170 um and it is if you try to pronounce the four letter word uh using Using these vowels, you end up with something like the following. Yahweh, Yahweh, Ye Yehovah, or Jehovah. All of these result in the same incorrect understanding of Hebrew. The reason I, I picked this one out is because of Jehovah Witnesses. I follow a YouTuber called Telltale, the Telltale Atheist. Um, if you just put in Tell, T-E-L-L-T-A-L, -L -L, Atheist, uh, you'll see a lot of the the videos that he uh, he has out there, and an incredible mind on um, rooting out cult like behavior and um, you know calling it out on the carpet. A lot of the individuals that he covers are either in politics or um, religious leaders out there who are basically brainwashing people. And I have a lot of um, a, a lot of negative feelings towards individuals taking advantage of others in that manner. However, the reason I say uh, that I wanted to go with this one is because he is a former Jehovah's Witness, and this is something that they think, oh, you have uh, the name Jehovah, that is the true name of God. Well, no, you, you actually uh, misinterpret it from a German... Uh, pronunciation of it that was from a Hebrew pronunciation of it which is also incorrect because we actually don't know what the actual word was they only put in the the yad he yad a um they they only put in those but they didn't have vowels so there's no way to actually know how to pronounce this uh this name of God and many uh, I would dare say all uh jewish people will not even attempt to say that um so much so i believe uh 
in Israel, I think they still to this day put a black like box where the name of God is. That way they don't actually say or ac accidentally print the name of God. Another thing further down the page on 170, the source of all is beyond comprehension except f for the ways in which the Godhead chooses to be comprehended. And the reason I, I underline this is because there is so much of the all, the you know, ultimate, whatever you want to call this deity figure, if you want to say God, then God, or uh, goddess, goddess, whatever, um, that we don't know. And it's because, you know, the all, the universe, universal energies, don't want us to know. There's only so much that we can comprehend, and because we can't comprehend it is probably because it, they, doesn't want us to comprehend it and that i'm okay with that so i, I want to read that again the source of all is beyond comprehension except in ways in which the godhead chooses to be comprehended so basically deity only uh you you only know that of deity in which deity wants you to know of it probably the longer form of saying that um and, and this goes hand in hand with uh, YouTubers, let's say. You know, you, YouTubers, um, especially those of us who are, are introvert, will only share so much of ourselves. So you only know what we actually end up showing you. Now, I am fairly um, open about my life and whatnot. Um, for the most part, there are some things that are kept private. However, for the most part, I'm pretty open but there are so many youtubers out there and and you're like oh well you know i know all about this person no you don't <laughs> um and i i know it's something that is uh can make you feel slighted but it, it's it, it's a privacy thing too we are still human beings after all let's move on uh to also on page 170 it says, in Orthodox Christianity today, Jesus was a specific human and God. Although many Christians didn't believe that Jesus was ever a literal human until it was voted to be part of the accepted belief system in 325 CE. I know many of you reading this may not believe it, especially if you come from a Christian background. So I don't... Take, so don't take my word for it. Check it out for yourself. And I have here, this is one reason that I like to approach uh, biblical text as a mythos. And I've explained this before, but I'll explain it again. That if you take biblical teachings or biblical scripture or scripture of any type as a mythos rather than an actual historical fact, which we don't know and most likely almost certainly did not happen the way it is written down because after all it was a mythos and um you know it was a a tradition that was an oral tradition at first um you you can't take it literally um so whether christ or whether jesus was an actual human being or not is still up for debate i tend to think he was an actual human being, but I could be wrong, and that's okay. It, it could be that this individual of Jesus did not do all of the things that he, is ha he has been purported to do, and that's okay. It is more about the, uh, the lessons that are imparted to me by reading these, uh, these accounts or these, um, these gospels or these stories that, that are told um, it, it's more about how it influences me in my day-to-day -day life and how I can better myself by taking those accounts to heart. Okay, the next part that I wanted to get to was on page 174. And I kind of, um, I, I want to just go over part of this, um, uh, this, 
magical statement or this um oh what was it a a a, a magical oath okay so one reason that I, I wanted to get with this or you know put a little thing on this is for one it is reminiscent of a masonic oath or an oath of office there are points that i don't agree uh with on this though otherwise it is a good oath um and one of the parts i don't agree with is the the sentence in here i will not use my occult powers for any evil purposes i think this is a is a completely subjective view whether um something is evil or not can be very subjective and from whose viewpoint um you know from a an evangelical viewpoint any of those types of uh powers or rituals are evil and from another person's aspect can be very good um now if you're using your occult powers to you know put somebody in prison who is a murderer then that can be considered evil on their part uh but it is good for society at whole or good for yourself so i if i did this as a an oath i would have to take that out because it is way too subjective to who is actually uh grading us on this this curve and another part in here is uh the part where it says Holy art thou, Lord of the universe, holy art thou, whom nature hath not formed. Holy art thou, the vast and mighty one, Lord of light and of the darkness. And I have here, this would be great as a chant. And I may use this for the church that we're starting. I think using this as a chant would be fantastic. It, it is non-denominational it is not religious specific it is um saying you know there is a higher being which you know if you're there you probably already agree on it doesn't say um you know a woman or a man or uh, a specific type of structure uh, it, it is something that has created the universe and i think we can get on board with that and i think you may see that come up in the um in the future church services when we actually finally do that and i also want to address that here um it is march i said i would readdress this in march we are going to continue to postpone this we have some things in the background that we need to figure out uh for the church as a whole and uh until those things are figured out we got to keep postponing that so we're gonna postpone this until about june july we'll readdress and uh see where we're at there i also have a lot of writings to do that are central to me actually doing the services and whatnot but it is all being taken care of absolutely so address that we're going to move on to page 177 how are we doing on time over there I'm actually talking very fast and getting through this fairly quickly. I've had several cups of coffee and um, yeah, I have other things that I want to do today to um, make sure that I make the most of today because yesterday was kind of a, a, a lazy day for me. So yeah, we're, we're just going to move right on here. Page 177 at the very bottom. Hebrew and other Semitic languages are similar in frequently having broad or imprecise meanings for words. Thus, although tikkun means correct, as in to make a correction, it implies the restoring of the soul to its true identity. Therefore, the reason we reincarnate in other life forms is to correct errors we have made in previous, previous lives. Okay. My note here is, I don't know about life, uh, life form reincarnation, but this makes sense. It makes sense to reincarnate to make corrections to your soul, to make corrections to, uh, in, in order to elevate yourself to the point where you re rejoin with the divine or uh, what have you. 
or maybe we just reincarnate and reincarnate until the end of time. Um, it, to me, I, the jury's still kind of out. I think we reincarnate to a certain point, and then we become the the spirit guides and, and guardians and whatnot for others. That's more my take on it. Um, I, I don't know about reincarnating as a as a rock, you know. Yeah, little rock says forgive. Uh, uh, always something I, I I need to look at and just you know sit here with. But you know I don't know if we reincarnate as a rock necessarily, as is said as one of the examples in here. But um, yeah, I, I don't know how I feel about reincarnating as an as a different type of being. I primarily think of reincarnation for humans into humans and then you know reincarnating as another human maybe going up to a spiritual guide of some sort but not necessarily uh reincarnating as a reed in a in a river or um reincarnating as a rock or something like that they, i don't know how i feel about that it is interesting though um uh, reincarnating into different life forms and whatnot that that is an inter interesting concept i just don't know how i feel about that um next one is on page 178 there's a passage in the bible which says god punishes a person for for his sins unto the third generation if you do not believe in reincarnation this implies incredibly vicious and and vindictive deity if on the other hand you believe that this is a type of twilight language and really means that you have to spend up to three incarnations to learn to correct past behavior, it becomes a reasonable and logical statement. Three lifetimes could easily be over 200 years, and that's a long time to spend on correcting errors in, in your actions. This may also be the source of Westcott's three incarnations error. And... The reason I, I, I noted this is, for one, because it has a biblical context, which I would like to look at anyway whenever we actually um, do our scripture studies again. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think this is a more logical step than saying that, hey, because you did something in your lifetime, your children, your children's children, and your children's children's children will all have a curse. I think that is a horrible, horrible uh, way to, uh, as a deity, to put a curse on somebody. I, why, like, at what point do we uh, no longer have to pay for the sins of our ancestors? I, I think that is a, a type of question that we need to sit with for a while and decide what the answer is for ourselves um yeah for me the whole three incarnations thing um you know that that makes a little bit more sense anyway <clears throat> moving on on page 179 this uh, i'm gonna read this paragraph and i only have a question for it simply the divine created all souls before their first incarnation Thus unrecognized, we are all imperfect parts of the divine source of all. Many have not incarnated as yet. It is, it is possible that some may never do so. As, or, I'm sorry, these proto-human souls are referred to as sparks in the Kabbalistic literature. These sparks are androgynous. When the soul is ready to incarnate, it is split in two. Each half will go to a member of a different gender. Each soul half watches over the forming fetus, but does not join with it until the first breath is taken. Also note that according to the system, you do not start as a lower life form and work your way up. Rather, you start as a human and you can work yourself up or down. My question here is, whenever this first breath is taken, is this the breath of life? We discussed this on, uh, on, on, on one of the videos. It was 
last year we were talking about the creation story and whatnot and i brought up the point of this breath of life and we had a little bit of a debate and whatnot in the comments and i absolutely loved it and i think i addressed it in a later video and whatnot but i am still fascinated by this breath of life subject uh, i think it is something that is incredibly um it's a small detail, but it can have grand uh, side effects uh, to how we address this. So, yeah, I, I have that question there. Is this the breath of life? The first breath taken, is that the breath of life this, where the spark comes into our body? And I think this is an interesting concept that I would like to sit with and mull over a little bit more. Let it stew in my brain thing. Um, but we're going to move on. Also on page 179, I have a little comment here. When the time is right, your true soulmate will appear, will be your current age, will be of the opposite gender, and will be will not be a blood relative. And I have a comment here that um, the gender thing, seriously, um, this was written in, what was it, 2012? Um... No, no, 2010, I'm sorry. Uh, the original printing of this was in... Son of a gun, I, I, gave, I, I did all this at the beginning of the, of the series. It had, it had to be... It was definitely earlier than 2010. Uh, and I can't see it here. But anyway. Yeah, he, he redid this in... Uh, in 2010 the the 12 magical lessons i can't remember what the original printing was for the first edition i want to say it was back in the 80s but i could be incorrect on that but yeah the gender thing seriously seriously um yeah and i i get that we've started talking more about gender inclusivity um recently in the more recent years but i mean seriously uh, even then uh even if we weren't talking gender we're talking you know opposite sex you know you know male and female yeah no no yeah screw that anyway i i have i i bumped on that hard anyway um I wanted to point out a couple things on page 188 and 189. Uh, first off is uh, where he says, of course there are similar situations with men, only only they tend to allow themselves to be manipulated until they, they can no longer take the ego bruising rather than the physical abuse. Sometimes people will, will tell me the same story has happened to them four or five times. Um, he says here, for for the women above these there there are many many lessons to learn usually such a situation is based upon feelings of lack of worth and need to and the need to develop self-respect and treat yourself well another lesson illustrated in the above example is to learn what attracts you to these bad situations and what attracts bad people to you uh, there are variations in the exact story and each reveals more lessons which can be learned the next part that i want to uh touch on here uh let's see where was it yeah here i'll start with this one is it an is it any wonder that most of the people who physically abuse children were abused as a child is it a wonder that most of the people in prison are serious felonies were four serious felonies were abused as children and i i have here there are several event examples here of victim blaming uh, and i have no patience for this um you know if somebody has wronged you time and time again there is no reason why you are sitting there blaming this individual could it have something to do with hey you know you're you're kind of going for the the bad boy types are you setting yourself up that can be the case however don't blame the freaking victim it is a piece of crap way to go about trying to say that your point is valid um the situation here of you know blaming people's crimes because they 
uh, were abused as children. You know, the, and child abusers begat child abusers, and which begat felony fe, felonious individuals. And, and I don't, I don't necessarily buy into that. Is there a catch twenty two cycle that tends to happen? Um, in certain situations, absolutely, I'm not going to negate, negate that. However, uh, I think that you are doing a lot of victim blaming here, and you're blaming uh, one person being a piece of crap on, you know, their parents being a piece of crap. Me, I'm not that much of a piece of crap, but my my parents, at times, very much were. So, and I, yeah, if they ever see this, I don't give a crap about it. You know, just because you've had a crap upbringing does not m mean that you are necessarily going to be or need to be a piece of crap. No, I don't buy it. I don't get it. Plus, there are certain individuals who had a very nice upbringing that ended up being very horrible people. So, I don't buy your your notion here that this is something that we bring upon ourselves at all times. Sometimes there are crap human beings out there and we need to address those individuals. Let's take a logical leap here. Yes, we're dealing in the metaphysical, something that doesn't necessarily have a, a lot of, uh, I don't want to say it doesn't have a lot of logic because we logically get to these, uh, these points. I, I don't want to say that, but, um, we are dealing in the metaphysical here. Yes, there is a lot that we don't know and we don't necessarily have scientific backing for. However, does not mean that one correlates to the other. Um, uh, and I can't remember the Latin version. It's uh, because of, therefore it is, or something like that. Meaning just because you see something and you see something that correlates to it uh, doesn't mean that is always the case. And I can't remember it what the, uh, the, the, the phrase is, but yes, if you know it, put it in the comments below, because I am just fed up with this whole, you know, blaming the victim crap. Stop it. Stop it. Okay. Uh, next part is on 194, and I believe this is my last note on the chapter as a whole, or the lesson as a whole, um, and that is about these five Tibetan rites. To me, this poses a problem, and my problem with it is that it is very ableist, uh, saying that you need to do this and you need to do, to do that. Now he does say in here, you know, do what you can and blah blah blah, all that stuff. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna negate that. Um, that he does say that. But we do have individuals within the uh, the witchy community that are in wheelchairs, that have a physical disability of some sort that precludes them from being able to do these individual exercises. So, can somebody please, for the freaking love of deity, write a book that is not an ableist type of book, you know, or is specifically geared towards those who are in a, a situation of disability where they cannot necessarily walk around a circle or they can't do these exercises because of their physical disability. Can somebody please include that in a book? Thank you. And then we have over here the review. Um, one of these uh, personal review questions that only you can answer. Um, <sighs> It really stuck out to me, and I think this is one that uh, should be in people's books books of shadow. Uh, for me, it goes on the beliefs page, but you do you. And that is, what are your feelings on reincarnation? Um, yeah, to me, the jury is ultimately still out for the, the um, thoughts on reincarnation. However, I do kind of lean towards a yes, reincarnation true. Um, type of thing, and I did go through some of that in this video as to what my um, my personal beliefs are on it. But yeah, I think that's something that everybody themselves need to answer, and uh, don't just say you know no, it's not true. You know, expand on that. Why would it not be true for you? Uh, what is your hang up with it if it isn't true, or is your hang up it on it? that if it is true, then this. 
Um, does that bring up a worse feeling for you and why? Let's explore those feelings and see why we believe what we believe and if what we believe is the re is uh, let me try to rephrase that is what we believe uh, because we truly believe it or because we are afraid of believing in the adverse I guess so in other words if you believe in reincarnation great why do you believe it if you don't believe in re reincarnation is it because you um, you are afraid of where you might go? Uh, if you believe in reincarnation, is it because you are afraid that you will become nothing? Or is it because you are afraid that you might go to hell or to, you know, some other place? And Jelly, don't you dare. She is on the desk, y'all, where she's not supposed to be. And she knows it. Anyway, yeah, explore those um, those questions there and really try to uh, dig deep on whether or not you believe something and why you do or do not believe in something. And uh, yeah, I, I invite you to journal about this in your Book of Shadows. Really dig deep into it. And yeah, I, I've done some light digging and I think I'm going to poke and prod a little bit more to see where I sit on this and why I sit in a certain area with it. So yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the takeaways for me in that, in that lesson. But anyway, that has been, uh, our lesson five of the modern magic, 12 lessons in the high magical arts by Donald Michael, Donald Michael Craig. Again, you can get your copy down below. And um, that's all that I have for this week. Wow, we actually did fairly well on time. So anyway, I will see you all on Tuesday for our Tarot Talk Tuesday. And then on Thursday for our Table Talk Thursday. Until next time, may you have love, hugs, and ladybugs. Bye.